Shabbat Shalom. Did anyone else notice the uh, conflicting instructions in the, uh, the Maftir that uh, Carol chanted? What are the conflicting instructions there, Judy? Remember and forget. Remember and wipe out and don't forget. I mean, it's, it's what in the world is God trying to tell us? It's only three sentences long, and yet we get three very different statements that seem to be mutually contradictory. So first of all, let's do a quick recap. The Amalekites. Not exactly a household name these days, but back in the ancient uh, Near East, the Amalekites were a major tribal group that was, well, famous, um, not just among the Israelites, but among other uh, ancient tribes as well, as being predatory in the extreme. I mean, don't get me wrong, all the nations back then would check out their neighbors to see what they could get away with when it came to border incursions and such, but the Amalekites were famous for being the most predatory and the most vicious. They were not the ones who would run out and engage you in battle directly. They would run out and, as the Torah describes, attack those that were at the rear of your caravan, the stragglers, those that were unable to keep up with the main pace of the caravan. That was perfectly fine. Everybody expected that. They would keep walking at a slower pace, and by the time the caravan made camp, the camp would be made for those to come in. It worked out very nicely, as long as you didn't have raiders coming in, swooping in on those people at the end who would be unable to defend themselves. And yet that was specifically an Amalekite tactic. As such, even though we might have been um, less than pleased with the Egyptian treatment of our people, even though we were less than pleased with the Moabite and Midianite and other nations' treatment of our people, the Amalekites are singled out for special treatment. They are, we are told we should never forget what they did, and we should wipe their name out from the world. How do you do both at the same time? Well, something like this. <whistles> Got your attention, right? Right, that's, yeah, it's a sharp, sharp sound there. But that is exactly what we're going for, and particularly what we're doing tonight in the holiday of Forum. All right, before you can understand why this, and I'm going to put that dangerous thing down, uh, why that is connected to the Amalekites and connected to Purim, and how it explains our zahor, our remembrance, as well as our erasing, we have to understand the connection between the Amalekites and the holiday of Purim. So, as I chanted in the Haftorah, who was the last named king of the Amalekites? Agag. Agag, right? It doesn't mean to have your mouth open agape. Uh, to be Agag is to be the last king of the Amalekites. Fair enough. We get his name very clearly here in the book of Samuel. Where we find out that King Saul did not quite do the job the way he was supposed to when it came to finally fulfilling the command that we read about in the Maftir section, which was to attack the Amalekites and break their society. He didn't do such a great job. In fact, Far from forgetting about the Amalekites, Saul seems to have learned from the Amalekites in the sense that he was more than happy to uh, kill the weak and take their stuff uh, rather than actually do the job as God had instructed, which is why the kingdom was yanked away from him. But that Agag, that final king of the Amalekites, he was not the last of his line. How do we know this? Because we flip ahead a few hundred years and we find the story of Esther. And who is Esther's arch adversary in the story of Purim? Haman, boo, right? Who we wipe out his name. Don't make me blow the whistle again, right? More classically with a grogger. Well, why? Because what is Haman's full name? Haman, the son of Hamdatta, the Agagi, the Agagite, in horrible English transliteration, uh, he is a descendant of King Agag. He is one that got away. More importantly, he didn't just get away, he carried on in his ancestors' ways. Because after all, what is Haman's plot against the Jews in Persia? We will swoop down and we will kill you and we will take your stuff. It is exactly the playbook still from the Amalekite tribal groups. The Amalekites were alive and well at the time of Haman, and they were still playing by the same set of rules. And 
That is why when we come to Haman's name during the official reading, you don't have to do it any other time, during the official reading, we still blot out that name because he is an Amalekite and we are still fulfilling that statement in the book of Deuteronomy that we just read. Everyone following the logic so far? Okay, if we got the logic, now we can get to the meaning because we're still left with the, the tension of how do we supposedly fulfill remembering and blotting out simultaneously? Well, it comes down to a misunderstanding of what Zahor means. Zahor doesn't just mean to remember. If Zahor means to actually learn, to understand, to draw information, meaning, lessons from. It's not just an act of mechanical memorization, which a, a computer can do quite easily. It involves a deeper understanding of the topic that must be appreciated on multiple levels. After all, when we have a commemoration for our loved ones who have passed away, yizkor, same root word, are we merely marking that they existed? Or are we reflecting upon the meaning of their existence? Who they were in their individuality, in their character, in the role that they played in our lives in shaping our destiny as well as our own sense of self? Obviously, it's the latter. We are not merely saying so-and-so lived, so-and-so died. We are saying so-and-so lived, and this is what they mean. When we remember them, we are understanding them, or at least trying to. When we remember Amalek, we try to understand them as well. And then we try to learn. As the old saying goes, everybody can set an example. It's just some people set a bad example. And from the Amalekites, we learn what not to do. And indeed, much of what the Torah's legislation about conflict uh, has to say comes as being diametrically opposed to the Amalekites. That is how we blot out the Amalekite legacy. We don't forget that they existed, but we do erase the behavior pattern that they represented. And we do that first by ourselves. So, the Amalekites came, they swooped in, they attacked those at the rear. Big no-no, says the Torah. If you are going to war against another group, if there is a, uh, a just cause for conflict, what do you do as you approach their, their people? What is a mitzvah commandment when you are about to go to war? You first offer them peace. You offer them peace. You don't swoop in over the hills and go, ha ha, you know, you didn't think we were enemies, but uh, got you. You offer them peace. Now, the Amalekites never offered anyone peace. You'll notice that in the story of Haman, which we'll read tonight and tomorrow, please be here, lots of fun games and special prizes to satisfy all ages. You'll notice Haman never asks for the Jews to comply with the rule. He never uh, approaches the, uh, the Jewish leadership and says, hey, you know, there's this one guy, Mordecai, of your group. He's giving you all a bad name. Uh, we need to solve this issue. No, he goes straight for the jugular, not just because he is a vengeful creep, but because he is also a greedy, vengeful creep. And if he had asked for peace, he might have gotten it. And if he'd gotten that, he wouldn't have gotten the loot or the revenge that he was looking for. Again, the Amalekite MO, that was what was important to them. Torah tells us that what should be important to us is actually finding peace. Now, if you can't make peace, that is to say, if they refuse to make peace with you, then you go to war. And when you go to war, you win. There are still limits. There are still uh, ideas of how you lay siege to a city to allow for evacuations if necessary. There are still limits with regards to how we uh, despoil the, the territory around our enemy's uh, areas. But we win. You fight until you win, because if they have refused to make peace, then you must understand that their intention is to kill you given a fair chance, or an unfair chance in the case of the Amalekites. And so we fight tooth and nail, which Saul kind of did. But like I said, King Saul missed part of the lesson. He did not quite remember what he was supposed to remember from the story of the Amalekites. He remembered the attacking part. He remembered being very, very strong in that assault. But he forgot the underlying message, which was that the Amalekites as people were not the actual problem. It was not that it was baked into their DNA. It was not that they genetically were worthy of this attack. 
It was they culturally promoted this value, which even in a brutal world as the ancient world was, stood head and shoulders above any other community in its rapaciousness and in its glorification of violence. And he forgot that as he built a monument to himself to glorify his own violence that he had just perpetrated. Now, you may be wondering, OK, yeah, but come on, the Amalekites were terrible. Uh, Haman was terrible. We see uh, on, the, on the pages of Tanakh, as well as the annals of history, these were not good people. We were not going to be able to make peace with them, right? So why bother? Why should we be shedding a single tear? Why should we be worried at all about the moral implications of what we had to do to defeat them when they were incorrigible? They were irredeemable. Well, because our text tells us we have to. Again, we go back through Torah, and what does Torah say? That the father should not be put to death for the sins of the children, and the children should not be put to death for the sins of their parents. Our tradition takes that very seriously. In fact, it takes it so seriously that when we trace the future generations after Haman, we can still find Amalekites. Now, I'm not talking about the rhetorical flourish that many people use of the Amalekite of our day is insert political opponent. I'm talking about the actual texts within our Midrash and Talmud that describes what happened after Haman. Well, we know, of course, very famously in the story of Purim that all of Haman's sons were killed, right? Well, why? Because they were involved in their father's plot. They, these, remember, Haman's kids were not 10-year-olds. They, they were full-grown adults. You don't get to be number two in the Persian Empire by being a 20-year-old with you know, a, a litter of kids at home. Haman was already an older person, and his children were already full-grown adults, and they had families of their own, and we did not kill their families. We killed them. They were involved in the violence against us. But we did not kill their children, which meant more Amalekites were still living. And when we trace them, says the Talmud, where do we find them? We find that some of the descendants of Haman became rabbis. They converted to Judaism. They eventually joined the Jewish people, became rabbis, and served in B'nai Barak as the, uh, the, the official designation for them. And what's more, they say in that same passage, that we find descendants of Nebuchadnezzar, uh, Nebuchadnezzar, the Babylonian emperor that destroyed the first temple, and Sennacherib, the Assyrian emperor that destroyed the northern tribes. They too had descendants that eventually converted and became sages among the people of Israel. Had we exterminated the entirety of those lines, had we sought only bloodthirsty revenge, we would have deprived ourselves of the riches that their descendants would eventually bring to us in their wisdom and insight into living a beautiful Jewish life. It's not easy. Right, that contradiction, that tension that we began with in the Maftir is intentional. We should not think that the Torah is telling us simply, carry out bloodthirsty revenge until they're all dead and then dance upon their graves. It is trying to tell us, learn what the Amalekites were like. Learn how not to be like them. Make sure they can never be like that, to fight them implacably whenever they stick up their head. But make sure that in doing so, we do not become them, nor that we deny them the chance for peace, for redemption, to indeed, if they wish, to become part of our nation. No one ever said life was easy. No one ever said life was simple. No one ever said the moral tensions that exist between us and those that we fight are going to be easily resolved in the space of a fortune cookie strip. It takes a lot of effort and work. It takes a lot of overcoming our own yitzhahara, our own inclination to do what is wrong. It takes a lot to overcome that passion for vengeance that can sometimes subsume all other moral values. But that's what Torah asks us to do. It asks us to not be the Amalekites, who had the easiest, simplest of moral compasses. I want it, I take it. If you resist, I kill. That's what a simple moral compass looks like. The Torah asks us to do better. Yes, we blot out that name. Yes, we remind ourselves of what they did that was wrong. And yes, we call ourselves to action to fight against 
any that would continue to perpetrate acts in the same manner as the Amalekites did. That's what that whistle does. It's, it's not trying to obliterate the name simply by noise. It is a call to alarm, and it is a statement against what the Amalekites stood for, a statement against what Haman stood for. It is sounding that alarm to say, this is what we hate. We hate hate. We hate vengeance. We hate those that would kill in order to enrich themselves. And that is a call that we will always answer, and that is a sound of an alarm that we'll always make. So when we gather tonight, and I expect everyone here, maybe not the bride and groom, uh, but everyone here to come back for tonight's celebration of Purim and tomorrow mornings as well, and that when we shake our groggers, blow our whistles, stamp our feet, hoot and holler, that we are reminding ourselves of this call, that we will not be Amalek and we will not, Amale not let Amalek and its heritage continue to stand, that the Torah calls us to a higher battle than that. Shabbat Shalom. And Purim Sameach.